Well, the good thing is that you can find, <laughs> well, more information about hyperthyroid cats on the internet than you would ever have time to read or watch, listen to. The bad news is that <laughs> not all of it is good information. There's a lot out there that's misleading, inaccurate, and in some cases downright dangerous. Quite a few that risk, you know, run a higher risk of making a cat sick, and you know, some that actually run a significant risk of being fatal. And some of that information is coming from vets. And that just, that scares the daylights out of me. I'll get to the hep. Um, and hey, I am not anti-vet. Do not take that idea from this video. Uh, I mean, we have been fortunate enough to know some, you know, people who are superb vets and superb people. <laughs> I've also encountered a few vets that I would never willingly uh, talk to again. Uh, but that's true of people in every field, I guess. Um, and, I mean, it, it, the vets aren't necessarily to blame at times. And I will talk a bit about that as well. Before I get to all of that, I do want to say this is the Hyperthyroid Cat Channel. I am Forrest Poston. I am not a vet. I am not a cat. <coughs> I am uh, an often confused person who spends a lot of time with cats. Uh, so I say I've been kind of down this road more than once. All of this is observation, experience. This is not formal medical advice, which also means, hey, yeah, please, do your own thinking. I think I'm right. That doesn't make me right. Your vet thinks they're right. That doesn't make them right. You have to think and sort this out as well. So, having said, oh, also, uh, please subscribe, please share, click the thumbs up button, uh, click the notification bell, and uh, tell your friends. I am in serious need of more watch hours. <laughs> uh, all right. Myths and Mistakes. And I'm titling this Volume 1 because, you know... <laughs> I expect to do several volumes on this. Unfortunately, there are quite a few of these. Some of them overlap, uh, but I may, you know, even when they overlap, I'll probably cover them because the perspective is a bit different. Today, we're talking mostly about things related to dose and related to kidneys. That does tend to be the main uh center point of treating hyperthyroidism. Now, one of the misleading or, you know, inaccurate is the idea that methamazole causes kidney disease. No, it does not. Um, <laughs> the T4, the main thyroid number, is frequently related to uh, the kidney numbers. And, I mean, it's not as simple as high T4 lowers creatinine, low T4 raises creatinine. It's a little more complicated, but they are connected. So quite often when you bring the T4 back down towards normal range, creatinine will go up. Not always. Uh, it may go up a little, may go up a lot, a lot of varying factors, but that's not causing the kidney problems. It is revealing kidney condition. When you have the T4 in mid-normal range for a while, then you know what the true 
kidney condition is. So the methamazole doesn't cause a problem in itself with uh, one caveat I'll get to, but it just shows you what the truth is. A high T4 can conceal the true kidney condition. Having said that, I'm going to go straight to possibly let's say, one of the most dangerous inaccuracies out there. And that is the idea that a low or low normal T4 is good, or at least that it doesn't cause any problems, and that is quite simply not true. It's nonsense. I do not understand how a vet can believe this, but a lot of them, not a lot, but way too many, will say that, hey, this low T4 or low normal is okay. And even as creatinine goes up, they will still say it's the kidneys. But in this case, it's not. I don't want to say the methamazole is causing the kidney problem, but the overdose is causing a problem. T4 really has to be in mid-normal range when you're treating hyperthyroidism. Uh, and vets recognize that high T4 of thyroid running the metabolism fast lowers the creatinine frequently, runs things too fast, causes problems. And yet sometimes they don't acknowledge the reverse of that, that a T4 too low runs things too slowly. Um, I don't understand how that idea has come about, but it is out there. We have, we've seen in the groups, we've seen more than one vet tell somebody, oh, hey, no, this is no problem. And, you know, the, they want to put the cat on a kidney food or other kidney treatments and just do not acknowledge that low T4 is dangerous. Now, there are times when you have to go through a low transient period, you know, particularly after doing the I-131, um, I mean, that's, there are protocols for that. I've got a video on that. But the mistake is believing that low normal or low T4 is not a problem. It can be a problem. It can be a serious problem. Left low too long. And how long is too long depends on kidney health to start with. But it can be fatal just because it you know it causes acute kidney disease not chronic acute um, <clears throat> and it's just nonsense all right now that's <laughs> uh, that's that's the harshest of the video other things related to dose uh, again well, let me, let me flip that, actually. We also do have the idea that running T4 hot, which is high normal or just above normal, uh, the idea that doing that is good for the kidneys because it might lower the creatinine number on a blood test is also false. Um, some vets, some people just believe too much in numbers as if they are absolute things. They are guidelines. Uh, if a hot T4 lowers the creatinine, it's because the kidneys are working too hard. You know, you, you are beating the crap out of the kidneys just to get a lower test result. Now, you know, and the result is creatinine looks better, but the kidneys give out sooner. 
uh, it's just it it sounds logical that hey since the number is better doing it is good but you have to look at the whole picture not just a single number T4 needs to be in mid normal range uh, dosing uh, one of them I this idea that you can't cut the pill when you're using uh, filamazole not true now Decra the maker of filamazole will tell you not to cut the pill vets will tell you not to cut the pill um, it's not true and since in the US Decra will not make anything lower than the 2.5 milligram pill it is frequently critical to cut the pill uh, and you know, you can cut generic methamazole you have to cut it because it doesn't you know it doesn't come in low enough doses it's made for humans uh, there's this idea that the coating on filamazole uh, is important and that cutting it somehow alters the effectiveness of the meds. No, the coating hides the taste and smell of the med. That's all it does. That's it. That's it. Um, and so cut, yeah, cutting it does. Okay, now the cat can smell and taste the med. You got to deal with that. Uh, but dealing with that is a whole heck of a lot better than overdosing the cat or trying to come up with some weird dosing where you do 2.5 twice a day, one day, uh, 2.5 once a day, the next, or whatever. That Those protocols are insane. Cut the pill. I would cut the pill. And they can be cut. You know, pill cutters will do it. It can be tricky. It can be done. Uh, or change to a liquid or a transdermal, whatever. But getting the right dose is the important thing. Uh, as far as I can tell, this really is just DECRA trying to cover their butt legally in case somebody cuts the pill, handles it with wet hands, which will cause, you know, you end up absorbing some of it, or handles it a lot and they don't wash the hands or wipe them afterwards, whatever. Um, and then, you know, if a person ends up with problems, or if a person just becomes hypothyroid naturally, uh, and then wants to sue DECRA and blame them, well, uh, DECRA's preventing that by saying, hey, we told people not to cut the pill. They've kind of eliminated the possibility of either legitimate or nuisance lawsuits. So it's putting legal and financial issues ahead of the health of the cat. DECRA could easily solve this if they would simply produce a 1.25 milligram size in the U.S. They did finally start doing it in the U.K., um, I don't know why. I, I, they probably don't want to go through the process of getting approval. I don't. I'm. I'm not sure of that. But Decra should ethically produce a 1.25 milligram pill worldwide, wherever they sell filamazole. Okay. Uh, I'm. I'm getting off on rants a lot. Sorry about that. Uh, some people are told by the vet that they have started the cat on the lowest dose. And this fallacy goes back to the whole DECRA and not cut the pill thing. Uh, technically, there is no such thing as lowest dose. Uh, you know, uh, you know, if you put it, if you use the liquid or something, you can get pretty much next to nothing. It wouldn't do much good. But... Uh, there are cats out there on as little as point zero zero point six two five. Yeah, <laughs> twice a day. Um, 
it's becoming more common as cats are getting diagnosed in borderline situations more and more. As best I can figure, when a vet says lowest dose, what they really mean is the dose DECRO recommends. Well, and, you know, I mean, that doesn't necessarily come directly from DECRO. DECRO. Uh, yes, the dosing is in the paperwork that comes with the med. But DECRA also spreads that information far and wide. And the idea has become that 2.5 milligrams twice a day is the starting dose. And it's not. <laughs> uh, it works for some cats. It's not the safest for a lot of cats. But if a vet says lowest dose ask exactly what they mean by that. Uh, American Association of Feline Practitioners says to start at 1.25 or 2.5 twice a day. So to them, 2.5 milligrams twice a day is essentially the highest <laughs> starting dose. Uh, 1.25 milligrams twice a day is the safest starting dose for most cats. A risk of side effects, risk of overdose, significantly lower. Uh, so lowest possible dose is a misleading statement. Uh, you got to get the details. You got to get the reasons. And, that, <laughs> and there's the thing. Ask why. A lot of us ask why when we're children. Few of us ask why when we're adults, and especially we go to any doctor and we become often either overly obedient or uncommunicative, because you know, quite often doctors are uncommunicative. Uh, ask why. And if any doctor won't give you a you know, good reason and keep asking, answering your questions, find a new one. Uh, you don't need to deal with people who will not discuss things with you. All right. That's it for today's video. Uh, I don't know when Volume 2 will be coming up. Maybe when I feel a little less like ranting. Uh, but I do thank you for watching. I'll be doing a variety of additional videos and some live chats, hopefully. Keep an eye out for those. Thanks, and so long.